Please help me in welcoming Tim Orr. Hey everybody. I don't know if this is on. Is this on? Can you hear me? Does this need to be louder? Maybe a little closer. I'm not used to it. It's not like I wear this every day. So anyway, hopefully that'll get worked out. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want to thank, uh, you know, Lisa and Ompa and, and, and Michael, especially, and all the other vendors and everyone else who's, you know, helping today. Uh, and for everybody showing up. It's really cool. Um, so today, it's like I have a kind of a general lighting set up here. And it's like, and I thought to piggyback a little bit on, uh, the lens event yesterday, uh, kind of walking through a little bit of like what I would kind of normally do uh, when I'm approaching a lens test uh, for, for a project, for a movie, uh, for a TV show. Uh, and so uh, later on we'll kind of, uh, we'll go through uh, a few different lenses from like more modern lenses to some older vintage stuff which has kind of gained new life in the last uh, few years due to digital cameras. Um, and then we'll end with, uh, we have one anamorphic lens and we'll look at that and, and along the way we'll kind of talk about like, uh, you know, obviously why you may choose a certain lens for a look uh, and uh, why they would maybe be more appropriate or less appropriate for the kind of different genres you may be uh, encountering in, in storytelling. Um, but before I kind of get really into it, I have a question for you guys because it'll help me maybe steer things later towards more information or general information. How many people here work in film, like whether it be, you know, movies, TV, commercials? Okay, most all of you. Okay, great. Of those people, and I know some of you guys, uh, how many people work in camera, grip, or electric? Okay, still a lot. Okay, so you're going to know a lot of this stuff. So uh, what I would like to do is try to hopefully you guys help me, uh, like, you guys get as much out of it as you possibly can. So uh, along the way, uh, the more conversational we can make this, I think, you know, hopefully the more interesting it'll be. Uh, and uh, so if there are any questions that kind of come up along the way, please um, raise your hand, you know, let me know, and let's talk about it. Um, so I've been doing this for about 20 years, going on 20 years. And uh, maybe some, some of you uh, folks have seen some stuff I've done. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always felt blessed to be able to work in the film industry and, and to work in movies and to be a cinematographer. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun over the years. And, I, you know, I've been able to, uh, you know, have one of those uh, careers where it's, it's, it doesn't feel like a job, you know. It's like it's... it's usually always a pleasure to go to work every day. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of provide a little backstory which will uh, later feed into uh, some of the lenses and lighting and, and kind of like say, because a lot, so much of this becomes personal style, you know, and uh, a lot of the tools, like whether it be the lights or the lenses, they're just kind of brushes in your paint, you know, in your toolbox, right? And, they're, and what, one of the great thing is, you know, about like, you know, filmmakers, artists in general, is there's so many different voices and uh, so many different ways to use the same tools to get different and kind of, you know, specific results. Um, so when I started out, uh, I, uh, I was working a lot of, before I went, I went to film school, like a lot of people do, right? And uh, I was working a lot of crappy jobs. And it's like, and I was at a point where it's like, what am I going to do? With my, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I want to do something uh, that I feel like I really want to do. I don't want to sit in an office and I don't want to work in a grocery store, even though those are totally fun things to do. Um, but I, uh, I thought, you know, I want to give film school a shot. Uh, if I could do anything, it just kind of came to me. It's like, I want to make movies. But this was something I didn't necessarily grow up wanting to do. It's like, I know a lot of people, it's like from the time they're like, six or you know ten they kind of develop a passion for movie making and it's like uh and that's what they want to do and and that's what they make happen i didn't really come at it from that i i kind of came at it a bit later in life in my early 20s i uh 
this, you know, I really started watching a lot of films, watching a lot of foreign films and American independent cinema. And uh, it then at that point, it like, it, it occurred to me, it's like, that's something I, I can do. And that's something I want to do. And uh, so then I pursued it through film school and um, went to North Carolina School of the Arts uh, from 94 to 98 and uh, met a lot of great people there and learned a little bit along the way. But the biggest thing was, it's like I was with like a group of people uh, who were just, they were like-minded and a lot of them were very talented and a lot of them I, I worked with for a long time, a lot of them I still work with. Um, and so that's been great and rewarding. Um, but uh, when I first started out and I got a, uh, an opportunity to, like I didn't, I didn't intend to be a cinematographer either. It's like I, I wanted to be a director, like a writer director, which I think a lot of people that go to film school, that's kind of a path that they kind of like want to take or that's more or less what they're interested in. And so that was certainly for me. And then of course in a school you kind of get, uh, exposed to a lot of the the uh, other arts you know like uh, you know writing uh, producing uh, editing um, and cinematography it's like when I kind of found that it's like it was something that I felt like an, a deep affinity for and uh, a little bit of understanding you know it's like especially like with lighting it was something it's like I found that the more I worked with the camera and lighting that that's what I wanted to do and that's what I wanted to focus on um, so uh, I did, and then uh, early on, uh, a, f a, f uh, a chap I went to film school with uh, decided that uh, right when we, shortly after we graduated, that he was going to make a movie or join the Marines. And thank God he made a movie, and uh, he asked me to work on it. And uh, we made this uh, very small uh, kind of crazy movie uh, called George Washington which maybe some of you guys have seen. Uh, it's kind of, you know, going on 20 years old now. Uh, but uh, it got out in the world miraculously. Uh, and, you know, some of those stories are quite, it's truly a miracle it got out in the world for many reasons. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and, and lo and behold, it's like I could actually do this as a career. It's like uh, once that got out into the world. So I was kind of really fortunate then. But, uh, Part of like what I, um, when, as a cinematographer, part of what I wanted to do at the time, there was a lot of like, uh, there was kind of like the dogma movement going on. And if you guys remember what that was, it was like, uh, you know, kind of a code of ethics of, you know, a way to shoot movies that was kind of democratic and there were certain rules uh, and, um, of, you know, naturalistic lighting, uh, minimal, I can't remember exactly all the, what the manifesto was, but, you know, long story short, it's like most all these were shot with, a, with the video cameras, like, uh, and, you know, whether they be been the Canon XL1 or like some of the other, you know, models that were out there. And since that was such a big movement and there was, uh, there was, my friend David and I had a bit of a, we were trying to push back from that a little bit. And, and even though there was a great thing about video cameras, uh, making the, the filmmaking process more democratic and opening doors to so many people that otherwise couldn't afford film, couldn't afford film cameras, couldn't afford all the gear to make it happen. Uh, that's awesome. That's great. And it's like, and you can even see today, it's like the, obviously an advancement of like different cameras and lenses. And I mean, movies are shot on iPhones now. And it's like, and some of me like embraces that and thinks that's really cool. And other, the craftsman part of me is like, hmm. Well, <laughs> not so cool, but that's a that's a side that's a that's another subject. Um, anyway, when we went into that film, um, we wanted to do something that was uh, bigger than what our budget could afford. Like and like, we had a video budget, if that, and uh, we uh, conned or sweet talked a, a lovely gentleman named Joe Dutton, who maybe some of you guys know who he is. Uh, Joe Dutton's a British cameraman. Um, uh, had you know for a long time and he became a lens uh, he ran rental houses and made his own lenses uh, uh, especially anamorphic lenses and he was an anamorphic champion uh, beautiful man uh, we uh, he had a camera house in Wilmington and we went down there and uh, and kind of pitched him our story and we have no money but you know I think we had seven thousand dollars and 
We gave him that, and he gave us some lenses and a dolly, and there you go, right? So, but we kind of started like, hey, we want to make an anamorphic movie, and we want to make it on 35 millimeter film. Uh, and uh, we shot it on all short ends, usually 200 feet or less. Uh, we could only see dailies once, halfway through the, because we could only afford to ship film once. Uh, so we only saw dailies halfway through. Had no idea if we had a movie or not. Uh, by the end of it, half the film got lost on the return trip. And I had to spend uh, a good week trying to track it down. Uh, and, the, if, and I hadn't tracked it down. It's like the movie wouldn't have never existed because it was half our... Anyway, it got sent back to the short end house as a mistake. And um, anyway, I've solved that problem. Um, but it was, you know, this is one of the miracles involved. But getting back to, uh, like, we wanted to shoot this anamorphic, and we wanted to make it kind of, like, bigger than, um, bigger than smaller and kind of, like, really uh, go for it, you know, which wasn't being done that much at the time. Uh, so out of that, like, uh, you know, part of, part of my... Uh, my, I guess you'd say my approach became trying to make an indie movie not look like an indie movie, you know, and uh, there, you know, like there would be no reason I felt like that, you know, an, uh, a small budget independent film couldn't look awesome and look and not look like its budget. And um, so I really tried uh, as hard as I could to, you know, like I adopted my, my taste just so we're kind of like a little bit more naturalistic, um, naturalistic style, but that, you know, had, uh, what's the right way to put this? Uh, hopefully an elevation in image, you know. Uh, so I, uh, the first several films I, uh, I, I shot were several of them were anamorphic. Uh, I'd say out of like the first six, I think first four or so were. Um, and uh, I would use a lot of the same lenses from Joe Dunton. Um, and then otherwise, it's like I kind of developed a bit of a of, of style that was some of it was a lot of it was based in naturalism, kind of like lyrical naturalism. Uh, certainly like Terrence Malick was a big influence. Um, and certain cameramen, uh, Nestor Elamendros and Conrad Hall especially. Uh, but I, um, I kind of adopted a, a bit of a style in those, those early period of years that was based on um, kind of more instinct than anything. Uh, because I didn't, the way I, and I'm backtracking a little bit now, the way I came into this, I didn't come up learning from uh, film professionals in terms of uh, working under other, other uh, cinematographers. I kind of started as a cinematographer. I did some work as a, as a grip and electric. I was a terrible assistant, uh, so I was never going to go that route. Uh, truly awful. Um, but I kind of like, I, the way I learned, I just kind of like learned through instinct. And uh, so at first, everything that I would do, I, I could, it, Every, the, in terms of lighting, all the lighting had to be motivated. Every, there was, I didn't understand, uh, you know, like a, a way to light a scene without practical motivation, whether that, mainly from the environment. Um, it honestly took me a while to kind of, like, once I started doing uh, a little bit bigger movies, and um, uh, I remember when I did my first romantic comedy, or I started to get into kind of bigger movies and then become a little bit more Hollywood style, that I began to like understand more and adopt a little bit more of like say the way lighting is kind of generally done, you know, as, as far as like there, you know, like there are certain rules that, you know, some people adhere to and some people kind of like break and I think the, the Usually the most interesting work is certainly when you're not following those rules and you're really breaking them big time. Um, and so that was, that was a bit of a learning process for me because I didn't, I didn't immediately start there. So it's like uh, the growing from uh, like an early cinematographer, it's like I was kind of finding my way kind of on my own, which it's like I, I wouldn't have any other way because I think it's, it's helped 
uh, at least uh, kind of inform what I do as a cinematographer. Uh, and it, it still kind of lingers within even things I do now that are kind of like more commercial, whether they be bigger, be big, bigger budget uh, and, and more commercial, there's still a little bit of that influence there. Um, so part of, uh, you know, like what we want to try to do today is I thought it might be cool to uh, look at some different lenses and uh, begin to kind of go down the path of, of uh, why you would choose certain lenses and um, for certain projects. Um, because like whenever you get a, you know, all stories are different and uh, all, you know, there's a lot of different genres and some lenses especially may be appropriate for certain like storytelling, certain genres and others might not be. Um, uh, so we've got some modern lenses we'll look at first. Uh, then uh, we've got, uh, I want to kind of taper it down again to some more vintage stuff, which some of the vintage stuff is, uh, since digital, you know, the digital revolution has kind of really happened in the last several years, uh, with the sharpness of digital sensors, like a lot of this vintage glass that uh, was very difficult to use in, when it was filmed, because like a lot of these lenses, they would like be 40 years old or, 50 years old and uh, you couldn't get enough in focus to like actually have it, you know, um, be an image that you would, you know, actually want to see. Uh, but they've kind of uh, had new, a new life, uh, which I think is really a great look. Uh, um, again, not appropriate for everything, but I think they're kind of interesting to look, to look at. Um, and then, you know, we can talk about like, uh, like along the way, like different uh, ideas and lighting. This is fairly general, fairly general setup, but like we'll try to work within it uh, to, um, to, you know, just kind of try a couple of different things out. And um, what, again, like what I would do when I kind of go into a camera test, a lens test, and like what I'm personally looking at. Uh, and I know it's like there's a lot of other people who, you know, uh, camera people also and it's like and you may have different opinions and you know obviously different um, ideas of what you would want to see so uh, I need someone to sit in yes to, to actually light if there's anyone that wants to volunteer for that great otherwise I can ask Lisa if she can help me out with this you want to sure. awesome thank you hi what's your hi. name Elizabeth. Hey Elizabeth, I'm Tim. So you can s you can sit time, there. Um, worked with Gary Sanchez for a long time. Oh, cool. And Joey and Dan. Oh, great. Uh, I love those guys. Um, all right, so. Tim, let me try to resync your audio pack. Sure. Work on it. All right. Was it working at all? It was earlier, and then you walked away. All right. Sorry. Anyway, uh, they're gonna. Um, try to fix this audio business. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, we have a selection of lenses today that's, uh, like, uh, Michael's very kind to, to, uh, give me a selection of lenses of what was in his shop, uh, very busy, which I'm very happy about, uh, but there's, so there's a bit of a limited selection, what I would maybe normally look at, uh, we may only get to look at, like, a couple of lenses kind of per, um, uh, set. So, uh, this, what we have up now is a, it's, a, the, it's like a Sumalux, right? This is the Sumalux, not the Sumacron, I believe. Yes. So, um, you know, this certainly to me falls into the category of modern, what I would just call modern lenses, right? Um, you know, they're, uh, they all match. Um, they, you know, like the, you know, they match kind of like in color. It's like they're usually, you know, uh, varying degrees of sharpness based on the different lens manufacturers. Um, but they have kind of like a, a you know a more modern, clean look. Um, some of them have kind of different color ca characteristics, like you know some of the different like whether it be Zeiss or Cook or the Leicas or or Panavision. Uh, I'm kind of a Panavision person. I have been for a very long time. That's predominantly the lenses I, I usually use. But but sometimes it's like uh, you you you're, you need to use a different camera house uh, and I've kind of done that too and and over the years I've used like most 
not all, but a lot of the different lenses. Uh, and uh, for different, like I say, for different projects. It's not like I just try to use just one, even though I, everyone has like maybe their go-tos or their favorites. There are different reasons why you'd maybe choose different lenses for different jobs. Uh, but this is the Leica, this is a 40 millimeter. Okay. Yeah, you try sure. This one more time? Yeah, okay. Technology. You had it on that side. All right, Let's see if this works. Yes, better, no? Well, if I could get this thing to stay on, too. Again, I don't do this every day, so. See, it's not even staying on now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, hold on. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Hello. How's this? Hello. No? No sound guy working? No? No? Okay. Hopefully you can hear me. If not, I'll try to yell. How's that? Um, Anyways, uh, so uh, yeah, so what I would do is like, um, like with the modern you know, stuff, it's like if I'm going into a project, it's like I read the script. Um, there's certain things you kind of start to get in your head right away about um, what kind of, what kind of film is it? You know, uh, is it for a studio? You know, like what's the, what, uh, is, it, is it a studio comedy? Is it a, is it a, is it a dark indie drama? Um, and I try to do both, by the way. Um, I kind of bounce back and forth a bit to, you know, part of me because it's like I, I really like independent movies. Uh, I, in a lot of ways, enjoy working on them more, even though they're kind of smaller and, uh, and you don't get paid as well, but it's like it's a kind of like it's more interesting storytelling. And I feel like that a lot of the time you can just kind of do an, more inspired work because you have a little bit more latitude to be creative. Um, but so with the, if I was going into say uh, a project to where it was, uh, we'll just kind of say a studio comedy for instance. Well I would probably start with uh, more, you know, like m more modern lenses uh, at least within the last 20 years. Whether that be Panavision Primos or, or, or Cooks or uh, Ultra Primes or Master Primes or Leicas. Uh, and I'm probably leaving out a, a good many. but. Um, I would, I would kind of start there as, uh, as a frame of reference uh, and sometimes it's like I would test other, other, if I'm doing a Panavision job it's like if it's, a, if it's a modern movie a lot of the time just because of previous camera tests I've done uh, to compare other lenses um, I usually know that I in, end up following a similar path and every, everyone develops things that they like and, and so I would maybe pick that set of lenses, whether it be the Primos or say the Leicas. And then it kind of comes down to uh, uh, within that set that is usually kind of picked out uh, by, you know, with the help of uh, not only the rental house but like the assistant. It's like usually assistant, it's like I would have them do a lot of the work in terms of like putting it on the, the bench, making sure technically everything is solid, uh, looking at the lens charts, um, which I sometimes do just to kind of like get, get, a, get a good idea of like if, you know, if there's any fall off across the, you know, the, uh, the range of the lens. Uh, but usually with the with more modern lenses when they're maintained, it's like there's a certain benchmark of, uh, of reliability. Um, so then it just really kind of comes down to personal taste of like whether you like the particular style that that lens brings to um, brings to the image. Uh, so like I said, this is, and I usually what I do is I try to keep it pretty simple. Um, I uh, usually just kind of do like a medium, like I start with medium shot uh, and then I kind of work in closer and it's just then it's like I'll see if there's different filters that need to be, um, that want to be used based on, uh, based on based on the look. So this is a, I don't know how many people can see that this, obviously to really check this out you kind of need to be a lot closer obviously. Um, but this is uh, a Leica 40 millimeter and it is, which is a fairly new, like it's a, it's a fairly normal lens, you know, like anywhere in those focal lengths to where you're kind of like 32 to into f up to 50 in my opinion. You, 
you really feel like you're kind of there. It's, it's a kind of like, a, it's the good lenses for, it's like when you kind of feel more immediate and it's like, and it feels like you're sitting across the table from someone. Um, and unless you're doing like a very stylized thing where you're mainly using either wide lenses, all wide lenses, not many normal lenses, or like more telephoto, really long lens, uh, you know, this is kind of like a, a meat and potatoes, um, uh, place to start in terms of like, I know I'm going to be using these lenses a lot, and I usually start with mediums, and then I work into close-ups, and then and then uh, decide on what kind of filtration, if any, um, wants to be used. And usually with modern modern cameras and modern lenses, uh, usually there's some amount of diffusion that's going to need to be used in front of the lens. Otherwise, it's just to my taste, it just feels too sharp. It's just and and so you're. You're, you have to fight against those digital sensors a little bit um, to uh, bring some of that, uh, just a little bit of that softness back. And that's where later on, it's like some of the vintage lenses, it's like one of the things I really, uh, one of the th many things it's like I began to really like about them when it's pr appropriate for a project, you don't have to use diffusion. Um, so this is the 40. Uh, what I would do um, is, what do we have next to this? Is the, what's the hundred? Okay. Uh, why don't we look at some of the different filtration what do you want real quick? Let's do the classic soft, like uh, maybe a uh, quarter. Sure. Uh, and then we can kind of do quarters of, uh, of the other two. Um, so there, like, you know, with this, it's like there's a lot of different filters out there, right? And, and this is one of the biggest things that's like ends up being tested unless I'm testing a bunch of different lenses against each other. Uh, like I say, in this current, like the more modern look, I'm not, I'm not going to test as many because it's like, and it's just because like over the years, I kind of know, kind of know what I like and what I usually gravitate towards. But filters become something that really, be that, that becomes a much bigger a much bigger decision because then you're really deciding on what you're going to use for the show if you're only using one kind, using two different kinds. Um, again, I don't know how well you can see this, uh, but this is these classics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one good thing about these, uh, and I use these a lot, I usually have them on every, every show. Um, they add a little bit of softness, but it's not apparent diffusion, especially when it's light. It's because it's like they don't lower the contrast. Um, they, um, so they can be reasonably subtle. And like that's kind of part of what I like as uh, my, m part of my taste is like I try to err on the side of being more subtle than, than heavy handed. Um, and that's just kind of part of the style. Um, so it's like I, I usually like to carry these just because it's like they, they still hold up contrast. There's, in lighter grades, there's minimal, um, there's minimal, uh, like, kind of halation, uh, you know, where you'd see around, like, lamps. This is why I always usually have a, a household lamp, and, like, this is a daylight reference to have my fancy bag. But uh, maybe just put those on the sea, storm, sea sand arm, like, kind of, yeah. So something else I'll do, and it's usually try, it, uh, it helps in, um, it really kind of helps with the filter thing. It's like whether it's a candle or uh, something like kind of specular lights like Christmas lights, that's where you'll really start to see some of the, how heavy the diffusion can be. And like one thing I, this is why I, I kind of like the classic softs is they are on the more subtle end, but they do a really good job of kind of like, you know, softening features. Um, uh, but they're not kind of like in your face apparent diffusion because that's once it gets to the point to where it's like it looks diffused unless you're doing like something that is a really stylized thing um, it you know to my to my eye I prefer it not to look filtered okay so this is a one right mm -hmm. yeah so you can start to see a lot more uh, halation around the you know the edges and this to me it's like especially on this lens um, you see it around the lit. You see it around the lamp. You really start to see it around the Christmas lights, right? This is kind of like a, you know, a pretty. I mean, it can look cool, but it also looks filtered, right? 
Um, so this is, this is, on this lens, it's like I would never go heavier than probably a quarter, you know? And a lot of the times you'll kind of like settle on, uh, with the exception of like, if it's a close up and you really try to need, the, need some help, <laughs> um, I usually never go heavier than that. Uh, it's just enough to kind of soften, take the edge off the, the, the modern glass, uh, but it, it, you don't cross that line of being too, uh, too diffused. So why don't we now look at the, what, the Hollywood Black Magic? Mm -hmm. And again, I just picked, uh, I picked three that it's like I kind of normally always test. Um, there's a lot out there. There's a lot that kind of like uh, lower the contrast, like Promis. Um, and I mean, there's probably, a, I mean, there's many, many more, but um, I, I personally don't like filters, just to my taste, that lowers the contrast too much. It's like I like to kind of keep, keep that, uh, you know, uh, fairly rich. Okay, so this is, the, that's the half black magic. So that's out, and that's in, and you can kind of see, this is even a little more, to my, you, you get similar halation around these sources, but it is just, is not t quite as kind of like clean as what I would just use that word clean as like the, 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 the just the classic softs. Um, there's just a little bit more silkiness to it, which I think for like the, the right, um, the right job, whether that be romantic comedy, comedy, uh, depending on what you're doing, this could be great, right? This uh, is too heavy for this lens also. So why don't we look at a quarter? Also, um, I always do, which, you know, like with, with these kind of lens tests, so often you find yourself in like a rental house. Like I, so many times I end up in just, a, you know, like a room, a lens room and a rental house that is basically a box. It's kind of like what we're doing here, right? And so uh, one, of the, one of the tough things is, is like whenever you're forced into only doing lens tests that way, which has happened in the past, um, you're relying on a lot of previous experience because it's like you just don't have that depth. One of the things it's like I'm trying to create here is just a little bit of that with, uh, you know, like with, the, say, the Christmas lights. But I always usually do tests outside always too. Like when there's a lot more depth, depth see what the lenses look, you know, in, in a very wide frame, you know, on the wide end. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously to see, you know, like the, the, in the, the, the daylight lighting difference. Uh, okay, so this is a quarter. Yeah, still, see, these are, like, this is definitely, to my, uh, a, you know, a bit more obvious filtration than what the, the classic is. So it's like, if I was making a judgment just based on what I'm seeing here, because this is a, this, I'm having this as a reference of a window. And uh, let's see. What could happen is like sometimes you have like really, really bright windows, right? And let's see, where is this? This is 12. All right. So if you have something that's like it's a really bright window, sometimes it's like, oh man, it's really going to bloom. Now, in the right situation, this could be super cool, right? Uh, you know, if you're going for like a really kind of high contrast, heavy highlight, kind of impressionistic kind of kind of thing. Um, the addition of the filtration could just be like a enough uh, of a sparkle, what I kind of usually call it. Okay, so now let's look at the, what's the other one we have? Sorry. Oh, it's the glimmer glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look at the quarter of that. Tim, could you talk for a second about why you would not 
to to do it in color gradation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Choose it here. Well, yeah. So uh, of course now, like with color, like uh, I always I, part of this is again, it's like it's it's someone's own individual kind of tastes. I. Uh, I consider myself a bit old school to a certain degree. Uh, I'm, I'm much more of an analog person. Uh, I like to do as much in camera as possible. Um, I know now with um, with color correction, you know, when you're in a color uh, uh, a color correction suite uh, DI, you have a lot of tools at the board now. Like you can add diffusion, you can add different grades of diffusion, uh, you can add green right uh, but to me it's just still not the same you know and it's like also it's like I, I feel like as a cinematographer you my personal opinion is that you want to try to maintain as much as much as much initial authorship of the image as you can uh, so it's like there are certain things that you may not there are certain situations you may not want to bake that into the to the to the negative but uh, I feel like that you know it should be part of the intent, uh, and if if you in prep with the the director uh, feel like this is the look of the picture you're making, then um, that's what you should follow through with, and I, so that's why I do it on set, and I don't leave it to later to color correction. Now I will say there have been. Um, films or like there was one where I did add across the board a, f a filter uh, as an idea <laughs> um, and it worked out totally fine and good uh, but it was that was the only time that it was not initially intended but it became an artistic choice uh, I would just rather keep it to that to where it's like I say artistic intent um, so yeah that's why plus is it fair to say that you're is basically hired to set that look and commit as opposed to okay just turn the camera on sure we'll put the lights where they're going to be we'll commit later well that well see that's a great thing you're talking about because uh it's part of there's reasons why bless you there's reasons why you maybe uh bring someone onto a project wh whether that be a director whether that be a costume designer a production designer a dp whoever that may be is because of their aesthetic you know like they're you know like the way you maybe like what they've done in the past you know and you like that look or that 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 instinct right um so uh yeah and what, what was the did you have a second part to that or was well, it I, I was just saying that, that at its essence they're kind of basically hiring you yeah to, to set the fun. look exactly I, ideally what otherwise if what if you couldn't end up at the color session Oh, of course, and, and, and well, well, the problem is, too, it's like uh, that has happened to me before where I haven't, I've been able to, and I make it a point to try to color correct every film I've done, but there have been a couple of times where it was impossible. I was on another job out of the country somewhere else, and then you just have to, it becomes a different thing. Uh, but, you know, now also it's like, uh, it seems like there's a little bit more of, the shoot it and we'll figure it out later kind of thing, especially with big sensors. Uh, I'm, I know that there are some filmmakers who have taken the, uh, taken the way of working of shooting everything really wide on a 6K, 8K sensor and then repoing everything, you know, in terms of that angle. And to me, that's just not filmmaking. That's not like that you've lost a lot of the craft. That's a way to work. And, and, um, but to me, that's just a bit lazy. And it's, and it's just, you know, not, um, it's not the way I would like to do it. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's see. What do we have here? This is the quarter glimmer glass, right? Again, this is like pretty, uh, this is kind of like falls into that sexy category a bit of like, you know, it's a bit more diffused to my eye, to my taste. Uh, I think that in, unless you're doing something fairly stylized with this, and we'll dial this, this daylight reference back. Um, unless you're doing something fairly stylized, this may be a bit much, 
You know, I think you'd kind of potentially, you know, it's better with, uh, you know, a little, now it doesn't look so crazy. It actually, you know, it's pretty nice. Um, a lot of that is like, you have to really watch out for big highlights, you know, because that's a huge, that can be a big uh, giveaway of diffusion. Um, and that's when you have to sometimes kind of dial it back. So, you know, now when it's like in, when our window reference is not as bright, this is pretty good. I think we can maybe get away with this. Let's see if we can get away with a half. Oh, so going back to camera t uh, lens test. So obviously here we're in like a, it's almost like the rental house room, you know. Um, ideally, I try to do tests on location, like in a set, like say it's a set that we, we built for the, for the show or, or if it's practical locations. Whenever you can go to the place you're going to shoot or in an environment that is very similar, it's like I definitely do that. It's just that's not always that's not always practical, that's not always possible. Uh, you know, it could be logistics, it could be uh, uh, money, uh, time. Okay, so this is the half. Okay, still, you know, you can totally, like, uh, you know, at least to this monitor right here, you could completely get away with this without it being obviously filtered it's like but you want to try to settle on like if you if if the if the job you were doing and after like different lenses obviously we're going to look at a longer lens um, but if you kind of settled on hey this is kind of like maybe a good look for this romantic comedy that we're doing um, then you just then want to try to pick what grade you want to try to to start with and then you know usually what I do is I have like a parameter of like whether it's like Always quarter on always quarter on the camera for most lenses, and then on a longer lens, it, it can either be either less because it, it, it amplifies. The longer the lens, usually the 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 more amplified the look will be, which we'll kind of see in a moment. Uh, there are situations though that when you um, and we can look at a little bit of this on lighting with the with the tighter lens. There are situations where it's like you have to go heavier because maybe there's someone in front of your camera who needs some help, you know, uh, and the makeup artist comes up to you and you're and they are like, I've done all I can, you know, you're going to have to do the rest. You're going to help me out. And it's like, uh, well, OK, great. I'll try. Uh, but you can only try so much before uh, you end up not you you're truly lighting the person not the story you know and um this is a little bit of a tangent but i always try to light the story you know um and first and foremost light the story not not lighting just the people but there are those jobs that you find yourself in uh, uh particularly depending on what it is uh some romantic comedy some comedy some and it's usually more in that genre uh, depending on who the, the actors are, sometimes big movie stars, um, to where you have to find, ride that fine line of hopefully still lighting the story, but taking care of the, the actor, you know. Um, and that's where sometimes when you get in those situations where, oh, someone doesn't look too good. It's like, well, you can try to solve it like when it, when it really spills over into cinematography, in terms of camera and lighting. Um, some of it can be angle that you can help yourself with. Uh, some of it, whether it's kind of like coming up on the camera a little bit, uh, you know, it's like a slightly higher angle. But again, you can only go too high before it starts to betray, you know, the shot, right? Uh, a little bit heavier diffusion, if you can get away with it. it depends how many highlights are in the shot. Um, and then is lighting, right? So. When we go to a longer lens, we'll kind of look at a couple of things that sometimes you maybe need to do you maybe need to add to like help out, uh, you know, a, and all this stuff to me is kind of unfortunate. It's just kind of like because it becomes like an expected look within, you know, the especially in the more commercial stuff, the indie stuff, it doesn't really like hopefully most of the time you don't even have to worry about that. But, uh, you know, like there's an expected look, there's an expected look in uh, 
certain films for the genre of terms of like lighting style, right? Uh, and there's an expected look uh, with the way actors look, you know? And uh, some of that is kind of like, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it just is what it is. And you just kind of have to know that and roll with it. Um, how yes? Do you, like, how do you push back on that? Like, like how do you delicately Well, it depends. It depends who you're delicately trying to handle. Yeah. Like, uh, because there are some people, I've had s some experiences with uh, makeup artists, for instance, uh, that uh, who can be very powerful, depending on like who they're working with. It's like if, if there's someone who is like, a, say, a big movie star, right and they like a lot of times uh, they'll have say someone with them for a long time and and they're 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 good at what they do there's a reason why they've been with them for 20 years right uh they like hanging out with them they're good at what they do uh but they take care of them you know and um but i've had some situations to where it's like it can be a little bit of a battle right because even though say it's a situation where they've done as much as they, they can in, in their world of, of magic in terms of making someone as beautiful as possible or you know what it, whatever the intent is. When it bleeds over into lighting, like I say, sometimes it's like, well, I mean, I've kind of done all I can too. Like, I, I hate to say I'm not a miracle worker, but it's like it crosses the line of like, is this a Revlon ad, you know? And, and then it just betrays the story. So when you start to betray the story, then it's just like it reaches the point where it's like, I mean, that I'm sorry, I can't. That's the pushback, right? And sometimes, well, I usually I try to leave the director out of those conversations. Uh, I would say, and I've never had this happen. Um, if the if it got to the point where it's a producer producerial kind of studio kind of thing to where it's like we don't like the way the the, the actor looks, uh, then that's something you have to deal with. Uh, I've never had to personally deal with that, but I've had to deal with everything up to that point. Um, but you know, it's like sometimes I hate to say it, like filmmaking, cinematography, it it can be the art of compromise. And it's like, uh, it's, I think few of us get in situations where you can completely do like exactly the way you want it to where it's like every frame of the picture is perfect, right? I mean, I don't know maybe if any, because everyone's even, even if you get in a situation where you can shoot in perfect light and you've done a great job and it's, you know, there's many magnificent looking movies out there as the personal artist or whatever, you're always going to have things that you'd maybe second guess or wish you could do better, right? And hopefully you'll always feel that way because I feel like that if you, otherwise it, you kind of get into a place where you're settling for something and it's just like, you know, it can sometimes never be good enough, right? Uh, okay, so let's see, this is the glimmer glass. This is the, so why don't we go to a longer lens now? Yep. Let's go, this, so we'll go to, we basically skip to the hundred. Which, uh, you know, is a, you know, certainly more of a close-up lens, unless you're doing, like, stylistically uh, a long lens uh, kind of look, a long lens kind of style. And, you know, and there are some of those, uh, you usually don't do that to, you usually don't do that as, like, a top-to-bottom kind of thing in, like, a, in most studio movies, but, um, you know, it, it can be cool, it just has to be uh, kind of appropriate for what you're doing. Uh, so yeah, so in this regard, it's like I would look at the 100 as kind of like a, a, like a close-up lens, and this is where we kind of delve a little bit more into, uh, the, you'll see the filtration be a lot more apparent. And this is where I'd truly settle on, like uh, with like, you know, having looked at day exterior, like a low light situation, medium lens, and, uh, long lens, like what the filtration uh, on, on a lens like this would want to, want to be for the show. Okay, so this, let, why don't we, we'll frame up and we'll start clean and we'll just kind of go through those filters again. Okay, so I'm not dolly grip by trade. Yeah, see, I told you. Okay, there we go. 
There we go. Let's just try that. So, okay, so now if you can give me some focus before we go to a filter. Okay, so obviously, you know, the back one of the characteristics of the longer lens, the longer the lens goes, the more compressed the background gets. Um, so this is uh, no filtration, right? Uh, clean, sharp. Uh, the, we don't have a lens chart up here, but it's like, you know, like most of these modern lenses, there's, there's not really, you know, like that much fall off, if any. Um, they're, they're pretty flat across the, you know, across the image. Uh, but so I would need in this regard, I would want to add, well, let's start with this. It's like I would probably dial this down a little bit. It's just a little strong for this size lens. And say if this was a window on location, you'd probably want to try if it starts to bloom too much uh, based on the longer lens and especially with filtration, then you just try to knock it down more with, with ND on the window or uh, usually that's the best way to attack it. Um, uh, it, just to try to bring down the level to make it more kind of photographable and uh, match the other shots. Um, so let's do this. Let's add the Corridor Classic to this. Hey, Brendan, could you take the fill light down by Five percent. Okay, that's good. Also, one of the things is I usually, with lighting, I'm not exactly sure with these monitors, uh, the degree, I, these kind of fell off the truck for me to a certain degree. Uh, usually it's like whenever I'm doing a lighting, a, a lens test and a lighting test, I'll usually always try to get a monitor that is, is calibrated as close to, as possible to, to where it's like I know it's good. I know it's some, a reliable benchmark is something I'm looking at because if you, especially if you're making decisions, especially if you're making lighting and color decisions, like especially with gels like this, I, I'm not necessarily going to get into that here, I don't think today for a variety of reasons, but uh, you know, sometimes it's like you're doing some tests with, uh, with uh, color, gels, right? Um, and I've done several jobs where it's like I would have a, an array of uh, what I, my gel book of like what I would be using for the show, uh, and I would test a lot of those colors. Well, like, you can kind of see here, it's like there's a little bit, like the color shift isn't really, I don't feel completely true. It's like uh, if you have a calibrated monitor where you can kind of, because um, this is a little warmer, obviously, this, this, the key is supposed to be a bit warmer. Um, but it's like, as, as true as you can get the color on the monitor, obviously the best you can, because it's like that's something, when you're making those decisions about gels, something you definitely want to do. Uh, okay, so this is, the, this is the quarter classic, right. Okay, again, fairly, like even, like you start to see a few dots. Like one of the characteristics of the classics is like they have little dimples that kind of disperse the light. Uh, like you, if you kind of looked at it, it's like it's got little dimples in the uh, in the glass, and that's kind of like the softening effect. So you would sometimes with uh, whether it be uh, you know a highlight, especially like say something like Christmas lights or like a lamp, uh, like a small ping, or uh, uh, like reflected highlights, you'll start to see some of the, like the dimples in the actual highlights, right? And the heavier you go, the bigger they get. Um, this is one of the things, it's like you see it all the time, like to, you know, like once, once you're used to seeing, knowing what a filter looks like, you see this in movies all the time. And it's, to me, it's like, it's one of those things that's like, can be distracting. And uh, you just have to kind of balance, like, well, the, if, if it starts to feel distracting, then you may want to address it. But there are times where you kind of have to roll with it based on it certainly makes the, the actor look good 
and I'm not betraying the, the overall storytelling lighting wise. So it's like, that's why sometimes you'll just kind of like, you live with that as a characteristic of the filter. So let's go one heavier, like a half. Um, also, I guess to talk camera wise too, sometimes on a, like on a test, uh, you're not only testing the, cam like the lenses, but you're testing the camera too. Uh, of course, this is, a ma this is a, only a digital thing. Uh, when it was film, you, it was just, it was what it was. Um, but uh, now it's like obviously there's, this is an Alexa Mini. There's Alexa, there's RED, there's you know, Panasonic, Sony. Um, and there, I usually like Alexa. I usually try to use Alexa on pretty much everything I do. Um, I like the look of this camera better. Personally, I do, uh, more so than the other systems. But there are uh, times where it's like I've, you know, especially with Netflix I've had in the past, and I know some other, some other folks do it too, where there's a, at least there's a K requirement, right? Uh, and at the, you know, the last time I deal with it, it, I guess there may be still only 4K, maybe someone else knows this, I don't know. Um, if it's only a 4K requirement, it, eventually it'll probably get higher. <laughs> um, but uh, when you have to kind of test different cameras because you say you can't use, I've been in situations where I couldn't use Alexa and then I would have to choose a different camera. And uh, that's sometimes not the most pleasant thing uh, for me especially because uh, I don't it, then it becomes lesser of evils at least again to my eye um, How do you like them the best? why do I like Alexa the best I just think it looks uh, the most cinematic the most uh, natural looking it's uh, I think some of the other cameras can look uh, a bit electronic mm -hmm. and plastic I just kind of put it that way uh, there I think there's a little bit too much K involved like they get a little too sharp and you have to work against the camera so much to bring it back to something that doesn't look like a soap opera, you know, like, or some, like the shot on beta cam, you know. Uh, so that's why I like Alexa, because I think it's the most, like, uh, like filmic, you know. Uh, okay, so this is, this is the half, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's kind of, we'll get a little bit of that window reference. Okay, again, not too bad, you know, like uh, I, you know, depending on the person you're lighting, like uh, this is something, you know, the, the, uh, the blooming of the window isn't too bad. I'll bring it up a little bit and you can kind of um, see it. You start to see a few more dimples, you know, kind of like the, these little, and, and a lot more kind of halation around the, uh, around the Christmas lights. But it's probably up to a point that could be acceptable based on the balance between what's the face look like and then also what's the background look like. Um, okay, so let's go this way. I can't remember what I had some of this at, but like the brighter, you know, but then you get into those bright highlights and it's like, and it's obviously, it's just gonna start to milk out more. But, you know, like again, that's, that's something you can kind of, um, you just manage on the day. You manage the situation by kind of like, you know, like um, having your, you know, grip friends especially help you out with like knocking the window down. <clears throat> um, okay, so now let's go to the quarter of like the next two and like, and we'll just kind of do quarter half. Um, Again, maybe I already said this, I can't remember, but usually like with the, like when I'm just doing the lens, lens filter element of it, I'll have a, just a very general lighting setup. This is pretty, pretty general. Like it's a, you know, just a three point, just uh, key fill and backlight. Uh, and like there's a little, just to have a color shift, I'll usually kind of add a little bit of an edge just to, just to kind of see how that, you know, what that reaction's like. Uh, and then later on, what I would do is then, once I've settled on what, what filtration especially, um, then I would maybe kind of uh, do a little bit more of a contrast testing within the lighting. 
Um, this is the, the, the pro, what? Provide ProMist. Oh, okay, this, okay, so this is a ProMist. Uh, I don't usually use these because it's like they, they lower the contrast a little bit too much for my taste. Um, and I think that these can very easily look like filters fairly quickly. You want to skip those for now? Yeah, let's skip those for now because it's like, uh, I, otherwise I don't even think we'll kind of get, get through everything. But let's just look at the, the black magic and the glimmer glass. Just that's because we what we looked at on the other lenses. Um, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So in terms of the lighting, yeah. It, so at a certain point, I would then start to look uh, what um, what I can get away with with the lenses in terms of how wide open I can shoot them. Uh, with the modern lenses, it's like for the most part you're going to be fine. You can easily shoot at a two. Like the, the ones, the, the, the say Master Primes that are even wide, like a 1.3 I think it is, right? Uh, usually don't have any problems, you know, because they're, 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 uh, they're solid enough, sharp enough uh, to where that's not as much of an issue. It's more of an issue for the focus puller. But uh, I would uh, see how wide open I could shoot them. I'd kind of like see what, uh, you know, I would make more contrasty lighting. I would then kind of like use just a practical, um, see how, you know, everything resolves. Um, but like for the filter test, I just keep it just really, really general. Okay, so this is the black magic, right? Yes. This is the quarter? Okay, so again, like slightly, it feels like, like a little heavier than the, uh, than the classic at the same grade. Um, it starts to feel like that there's a little bit more kind of like uh, diffusion going on in terms of like a, maybe a slight lower end of the contrast, but it's still, you know, it's still not too bad. Um, you, you lose a lot of the, you, you still can kind of see some pattern in the, the highlights, but not, not as, there's not like the kind of like the little dimpled circles like with the classic sauce. Um, can we see this and just pull it out? And I'd always usually A-B it, like that's clean, and it goes back in, kind of see the difference. I feel like that going heavier on, on with these is going to be too much, but let's look at a half. I think then we're going to cross the, cross the line of now it looks filtered and, you know, um, probably wouldn't go there. It depends on the lens, yeah. you know, uh, some lenses and it depends on the project, depends what story you're telling, right? Um, uh, it, with lenses like this, which I'll just place in the modern category, I usually try to always, usually on an interior, never deeper than a 2.8. Uh, but I would try to work usually within that 2 to 2.8 range, you know. Um, and depending on the exteriors, to me, just personally, I kind of feel like there should be a little bit more depth of field, like for day exteriors especially. Um, so it's like, I know some, and this is where it's like all cinema, or cinematographers are different. Uh, you know, some I know may like want to shoot everything wide open always, right? And I know that's, that can look cool. Uh, but personally, I think that there should be just a little bit more depth of field for the exterior. So that's why I try to keep that between like a four and a five, six, but usually, usually not much deeper. But you get in those situations depending on the lens, say. Say you're in a long lens, like a really long lens. Um, and you may find that you need to help the focus puller out by giving them more stop. You know, then it's like, you know what? Maybe you should be, maybe we should be at an eight here. If you're on like a, a 300-ish mil lens and you're doing like, say you're having them do some sort of like walk up on a 300, you know, like a, the long end of like a 280 or something. A little bit more depth of field, like you're not, A, you're not going to no, like notice it that much because the, there's so little of it anyway. I mean, you're talking about like kind of on the, like it can be feet the ten to then inches. Um, but yeah, I try to kind of keep it in that 2.8 inside, 2 to 2.8 inside. But uh, also it's like, which we'll look at maybe later uh, when we're looking at the older glass. I mean, some of these lenses you can't shoot 
like I, I know I did them film uh, with Super Baltars, which we'll look at a couple of Baltars, and I have not seen these. Uh, but they were, they were definitely a ri some original Baltars that were rehoused, but they were funky, big time. And you couldn't shoot them wider than a four. And nothing would be in focus. Uh, thankfully, that, that movie was almost entirely the exterior. Um, so uh, this is, uh, what is this? This is the... This is the half. Okay, this is the half. Okay, again, um, I probably would not go heavier than this. I think it would be situational. Um, where, you know, where you, like if for some reason you had like a, a little less, a flatter background, not as many highlights, you could probably get away with a little bit heavier if you had to. Um, but it starts to kind of get into that realm to where it looks like it's filtration. Okay, so let's look at the glimmer glass and then we'll go to uh, some of the older stuff. Okay, so we'll dial this back up just to see. Um, let's see, while I'm, we're changing filters, you know, this I've kind of just set up is just what I maybe normally do for me, which is pretty low-fi, real simple. Um, but then sometimes you have to do the hair makeup test, right? Um, and usually those, you don't, like, you don't do them on every job, but uh, you certainly end up doing them a lot of the time on any studio movie. You're usually always going to do one of those. And it's like, and it's going to be, it's kind of the big dog and pony show to a certain degree um, where, you know, studio looks at it. There's, everyone has comments. Like, you, you know, there's certainly reasons for it. And uh, multiple departments are making decisions on why you're doing it. But whenever I do those, and this is the glimmer glass. So again, uh, I'll get back to that in a second. So this is obviously pretty, you know, like uh, the, um, the flare from this filter. Can we pull that out real quick? Is a lot more noticeable, right? I mean, you were still getting flared a little bit by just the nature of the long lens, you know? But it amplifies it a little bit. So let me take it back down to like a, what I'd say is a more not so stylized level. Right, that's the 12% we've been looking at. Okay, so that filter can go in. Okay, so a little bit, but again, you know, not bad. This is just kind of like a different flavor, a different choice. Um, this very similar to the Black Magic in a way in terms of the, how it resolves some of the highlights. Uh, but, you know, again, kind of smooths things out in a similar way, and I think it just becomes about taste. It's like some people may like, may like any one of these three filters, and, or they may, they may go for something else. Um, but that really kind of comes down to just personal taste of, as, of the cinematographer. Uh, let's look at the half and then we can move on to something older. Uh, but to finish maybe the thought I was, like, had about like, when you're doing the, like, the true hair makeup tests, um, what I, the way I approach those also is in a very like kind of, you, you sometimes want to try to, if you need to mimic a certain look, if you have a very uh, stylized look for a film, let's say, uh, there's potential reason to like build that into your lighting setup. Uh, if, if for instance, it's like, you know, it's going to be a really high contrast, saturated look. This is just to be arbitrary about it then you want to mimic that within the, the lighting setups just so that because that way it helps other departments, um, you know, hair, makeup, wardrobe, uh, and sometimes uh, art department. Helps them make decisions. Helps them make decisions on color. Helps them make decisions on, you know, how light to go with the makeup, uh, you know, what, how something reads on camera. But if something, if it's not that, if you're not doing a really stylized look, a lot of the times I try to, again, keep it, like I use it like big source, like big light, big source, really soft, fair, like make it look good, but then also don't make it look to, to where it's like there's questions about the lighting because that we're going to be doing on set telling the story anyway. And then it, then it becomes a, maybe a neutral uh, way to judge hair, makeup, wardrobe. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, again, not too bad. Um, minimal differences between, I think, these last two uh, filters. Uh, I think you could certainly get away with this to my, to my taste. 
Uh, but again, like between when you're choosing between the, the, at least these three grades of diffusion, it's personal taste, right? So uh, maybe now let's look at the super speeds. Uh, and we can start with the, th let's just go 35, you know. Um, we don't have a full set of a lot of these lenses. Um, uh, so that's going to dictate to a certain degree, um, you know, what we have to choose from, just so you understand. My water. Hold on one second. Thanks. Oh yeah, can I get one of those? Okay, so uh, these, uh, let's see, we have a few Super Speed Mark IIs, I believe these are, right? These are Mark IIs? Yeah, one, two. Yeah. Um, All the uh, Super Speed glass. You get, they can be quite sharp. They can, like, uh, like look really great. Uh, I think, in some ways, they're kind of like a middle ground. Uh, some of the lenses, especially on the, the, the longer end, I, you could still, with a digital camera, still be in that place where you may need to use diffusion. Uh, it really depends on the set you get. Um, I've shot a, a couple, let's see, I did a movie with these a while, a while ago, and a t TV show with these. Um, and uh, the biggest thing with, with uh, super speeds is like how, let's drive in a little bit, um, is where you shoot them at because it's like I think you'll you'll kind of find with um, what's the cable there I'm gonna kick the cable out um, you kind of find it's like these are very difficult to shoot wide open um, and unless, unless you have a, like a really really good set of them um, they can be like again one of the situations where it's like there's just not not enough depth of field, not enough in focus. Okay, so we'll pan the camera. I'll just try to get a little bit more balanced. Oops, somewhere there, okay. All right, so we'll get some focus going. We'll tilt down a little bit, get rid of this flare. Maybe we even boom down some. Okay. All right, so 35 millimeter super speed. Uh, this is no filtration. Uh, pretty sharp. Uh, this, these lenses, I'd start. I'd certainly want to look at personally on a chart to like really see kind of how they resolve uh, and know if they're can you throw in uh, no throw in the 6 and D and then we'll go wide open um, I would certainly the, these lenses I would definitely test the stop I would kind of shoot them at different stops uh, especially on the wide end, to find out where you don't want to go. Um, just from previous experience on these lenses, uh, at least from the ones I'd, I'd used, one film was a, a, while, a while ago, and it was a Super 16. Actually, the both times I've used these were Super 16 uh, jobs. And uh, at the time, the first time I used them, uh, it was, uh, there was no DIs, you know, there was no, uh, this was right before that kind of started to kind of come in. So it's like you had to do optical blow-ups. So uh, I 
uh, had done as much research as I could and, enough, and as much testing as I could to try to get as good a blow up as possible. Something that would look not look 16 because it's like we were shooting 16 out of, it wasn't a 100% aesthetic choice, it was kind of partially budgetary. Um, okay, and then you can just go wide open. That's wide open? Yeah, okay. All right, so we give me some focus there. Thanks. Okay, so and is that tack sharp? Like pulling tape, you know, normally we'd maybe pull even, pull even pull tape and stuff like that. So this, like, I'm looking at this pretty close, and it's just, it's maybe just there as far as being sharp, but it's very mushy, right? As far as being wide open on this lens. Uh, and this is again like that middle, that middle normal, normalish range, wide normal. Um, the longer you get, it's just gonna be a much harder for the focus puller. Cause this is kind of like you're like, depending on you know, how much the actor moves, it's like with this amount of mushy depth of field, it's, uh, it's potentially trouble, right? Um, and I've just, uh, I know people who have had a fair amount of problem like uh, when you're trying to shoot these wide open. You stop down, like we can lose the ND, you, and go back to a 2.8. You stop down like a stop or two, boom, they look great, you know? Uh, and like, you can, like uh, they can be completely reliable and look super, but this is just one of the things, they're just a little, you're not gonna have as much of an issue at all. Like the, you, can, you can usually get away with that. It, again, depending on the lens, just to, if depends if your focus puller wants to kill you or not um, and that's a hard job so uh, okay so now we can add some like add a bit of filtration to this this is the longest one we have too right we don't have anything longer than this okay so we may do a version of this where we'll kind of Or is when I'm looking for a more vintage kind of like older kind of look. Uh, I have, let's do that. I usually pull these out. I use, uh, like I've tested uh, Cook S3s and, uh, and Super Baltars. Uh, Kawas. Um, kind of side by side, same situation. Uh, I've done that on a few different projects in terms of trying to, because when you really go in the vintage route, they can really be wildly different. Like the difference between like say the more modern lenses, whether, you know, a lot of the, the brands that we, you know, spoke of earlier, they're, the variances are gonna be much smaller. And, uh, you know, like you can find comparable, uh, whether it be Zeiss, uh, you know, like, you know, some of the, the Zeiss look or like Zeiss cook, Panavision, I'll just kind of leave it at those. Um, there's certain characteristics that are going to be fairly uh, close, right? Um, but when you get to the more older stuff, boy, that really broadens out big time. Uh, and so a lot of the times I'll find the super speeds are kind of like a, a little bit of a, a control, you know, uh, to where they're, they're, they have some character, that, but they're not kind of crazy. You know, they, because they're, again, on that kind of middle ground of, of modern to normal. Um, okay, so, but again, I'd probably, uh, especially with the digital sensor, I'd, I would add some diffusion. So why don't we, uh, we'll uh, go to the, again, we have the, well, this is the quarter, right? Mm -hmm. So I would look at, uh, let's, let's go heavier. I always find it's yeah. good to kind of like uh, sometimes go too far. Um, that can be like with when you're looking at filtration or it can be like when you're doing a color correction and, it, and you're, you're kind of finding what level of, um, you know, where you want to be at color wise and contrast wise, sometimes it's, you know, it's helpful to go too far. So I, I definitely do that with diffusion sometimes too.
Okay, so that's the half. Okay, uh, yeah, not bad. Um, again, this is the classic, so you'll start to see some dimples, um, but this d doesn't look overly filtered to me. Uh, it feels like something that, you know, could be a candidate for filtration that would be, you know, we'd be using on the movie. Um, then the next would see this, how they handle highlights, like greater highlights. And you know, not too bad. Again, th this, these are, uh, um, they can handle a lot, right? Uh, so let's go heavier now. Let's, with the same grade, let's go to a one. And I think when we get to, uh, like after this set, uh, we'll probably don't, like, it, we'll reach that point where it's like the filtration doesn't matter as much. Um, we, like, I, for instance, when we get to, uh, the Baltars, I don't think I would need to use diffusion with those. Uh, at least in the past when I've used them, certainly didn't need to. Okay, so that starts to feel too heavy, right, especially with the highlights, right? Starts to kind of, obviously, you know, halation and, and, and a little bit more of a flare you're kind of getting from this, which starts to milk out the image, which is something we don't want. So we can still look at it at a more normal look here with the lighting. There we go. All right. Uh, you know, when, when you kind of bring it back down, though, to uh, when you're not dealing with heavy highlights, uh, big, bright backgrounds, uh, again, you can probably, if you had to get away with uh, this grade, you could probably do it, but I'd probably stick within that quarter and half range for sure. So now we'll just look at the couple of others and then um, we'll see where we're at time-wise. I'm not sure if we would be approaching a, a break at that point. Um, and then probably look at the other ones, like the after, after the break, and then we can maybe talk a little lighting things too. Black magic. Yeah, black magic, and then the glimmer glass. Any other que at the moment, like questions, thoughts? Not right now. So this is a twenty-five. Um, and this is, of course, wider than what we would normally shoot a medium shot on. Uh, but uh, we only have like a 25 and a, a 100, I believe. Um, so, and I want to just stop down just a little bit. So, you know, with these lenses, uh, depending on what set you get, where you get them, uh, a lot of them are rehoused by different companies. Uh, um, this is the first time I've seen uh, Michael's uh, set of these, and I haven't seen this version of, a house, of some of the housings. Uh, a lot of them can be different. Um, there's some companies that are rehousing these that do a better job than others, um, and um, they're getting better and better with it. And I know it's like even, even talking to some people yesterday, it's like, They've now taken to trying to take the characteristics of these lenses and uh, produce them with, you know, it's kind of like new glass, uh, <clears throat> but they, you know, they could, the, the upside is they, they could be color matched and they would be kind of consistent across the range. Um, one of the things with the, when you get into this era of glass and, and I would say like uh, th these lenses and then the cook, S2s, S3s, um, which were from a similar era. Uh, a lot of people call them speed pancros. Uh, you're going to get, like from lens to lens, a lot of them are not color matched. Like one may come up um, very warm. Um, one may, you know, and by like um, almost the, the type thing that you would definitely, with the DIT, have to build in correction for each lens. Uh, they, every, once you put one on, it's going to look the, say the, the difference between the 25 and the 35, they could all be different. Um, so that's something that's like they usually need to be prepped pretty well. Uh, one of the downsides is depending on what set you get, where you are, you may just get one choice. This is what we have. You either like them or you don't, right? 
And uh, in the times that I've used them, uh, I've, there's something about the look of the Baltars that I've gravitated towards. And I've chosen them over other vintage sets just because I just like the way they look, right? And, but one, one of the things that come with baggage, right? And some of that baggage is that you have to accept their flaws. And I think possibly uh, just the, my taste, like where I came from is, this is why I tried to lead with a little bit of backstory. Um, I kind of like flaws. I think that's, that can make things feel interesting sometimes. When, when sometimes when like light, light is too perfect or like anything's too perfect with the image, it can just start to feel, eh, it loses a little bit of character to me, right? Um, of course, that depends on what story you're trying to tell. There are some, like, there are some stories that need to be really rigid and precise and, and completely clinical and, and, um, and that becomes part of the style. But as far as like general taste goes, I kind of like it when there is something that's a little fucked up about it, you know? And this is one thing I really like about these lenses. So um, this is the 25. Uh, you, you'll start to see, and, and apology, like, you know, the monitors, I, w I wish we had a tech, like, you know, even DIT monitor that was truly, uh, you know, reliable to judge, you know, a lot of the stuff we're looking at, but um, you'll start to see with like the, like a little bit more distortion in, and hey, uh, Trip, we may want to push our map box a little bit. I think we're getting a little vignetting that is not the lens, I think, but let's check. Thing with these lenses, you never know. Um, because sometimes one of the characteristics can be, and you really start to see this uh, on, uh, on day exteriors, big wide shots with a, with a lot more depth and a lot more dynamic range in terms of the contrast. You will see often that these, these lenses start to vignette around the edges uh, to where it's like the, the, whereas the modern lenses, they could be uh, sharp from edge to edge, corner to corner. Uh, a lot of these lenses start to get soft in the corners, like whereas like if you, um, if you were looking at them on a focus chart especially, it's like you'd certainly see it. Uh, so that was the matte box. Uh, hey, can we dial down the backlight just because it's like flaring our lens a bit? And it, it won't make any difference. It's, you can, yeah, something like that, okay. So these lenses uh, usually are a little bit less contrasty than a lot of the modern glass. Uh, they have an inherent softness to them because it's like part of it's their age and part of it was, uh, you know, just, I think, technology of when they were made. Um, a lot of the times you'll find uh, kind of color shifts in terms of like, I found a lot of these lenses to be, it's like, if you were, say, kind of filter, you don't really do so much anymore, uh, use like, say, colored filtration. You wouldn't have to with these <laughs> because a lot of them come up very, uh, uh, you know, some of them can be quite yellow. Uh, but the problem would be you would have to try to match them from, from, uh, from lens to lens. And if you were doing something on film, you may want to help yourself out in terms of like really figuring out what that is and, and whether you're using behind the lens uh, filtration or in front of the lens, you may want to try to even that out a little bit. But you would sometimes find like uh, whether it's being uh, light vignetting around the edges that, uh, that could be a vignetting in terms of... Uh, um, <clears throat> density, but also it's like more common is just kind of vignetting in terms of like focus to where it's like they can have a very kind of painterly quality to where it's like the, the edges and the top bottom of the frame are a little softer than the center, right? Uh, I've found this mainly on the wider lenses in the Super Baltars than some of the, some of the tighter ones, but like again, the, however many sets there are out in the world, uh, they're all going to be different. Um, so, with these lenses, I wouldn't even, like, uh, again, uh, this would be subject to deeper testing, and I would certainly encourage that. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose these probably to shoot, like, say, a uh, high-key, like, a studio comedy, or a, like, kind of, um, a, probably not, like, something that's, you know, ultra-modern, science fiction, et cetera and so forth. Something that kind of wants potentially a crisper look. This probably isn't what you want. 
uh, if, if you're kind of looking for something that's like it's a little, a little more vintage, a little more like kind of the period piece, whether it even be something from the, you know, the 70s or, you know, uh, or uh, earlier, uh, could be a really good choice. I shot a pilot uh, on the Baltars that was set in, um, uh, it was F. Scott Fitzgerald era, so it was kind of like 20s. It was, I think it was set in the 20s, uh, and they were great for that. Um, had you know kind of a really specific look and and really kind of I, I, I thought really helped uh, <clears throat> tell the story and that's kind of like one of the things you're trying to do with these lenses uh, I did a movie which um, I'll probably show a clip from uh, that uh, we used the Super Baltars and um, they were <laughs> you know they were we had a quirky set for sure and especially on the wide lens for those, they were pretty vignetted, like really kind of soft at the top. And you really had to think about that in framing. Like if you're like using that, if you're using that particular lens, which was uh, 20, I think, um, you really had to uh, be careful about where you put a face. And some of that, uh, usually I would only use them for very wide shots and it didn't matter. But it's like, again, I really liked the fact that it had some uh, flaws. You know, um, that was part of why I wanted to use them. Um, but then as you went farther in the range, uh, <clears throat> 35, 50, uh, to 100, they were a, lot, a little bit more consistent and um, did not have to deal with as many, um, as many issues. Uh, a lens like this, you, I, again, I think you definitely want to look at uh, in a day exterior situation, especially on the wider end. Um, you also would really want to kind of find out like where your sweet spot is on the, on, on the, uh, uh, what aperture you want to shoot at because some of these, um, I found it difficult to shoot wider than a four. Um, it, again, went to particular set. Some set you may get like you may be able to shoot them wide open and they may be great. So here, let's, uh, go to like, yeah, some ND. Okay, so this, is, so this is wide open on this lens, and it's a l we're full up on the fill, right, Brendan? Okay, how about going to, uh, like, say, 1,000 ASA? <clears throat> um, but, again, you know, like, this is wide open, and although pretty sure, Chart. I, it looks, you know, it, not dissecting this on a focus chart, but um, sharp enough, but you really start to see this falling off, especially on the edges and definitely in the background, right? Again, this isn't a lens that you're going to usually shoot too close unless you're like we, you know, probably if we'd had a 35, I'd definitely be on that. Um, <clears throat> but this is kind of for demo purposes. You kind of, you, you see that there's automatically an inherent softness here. Now, I guess just to see what, how this lens reacts, it's like we can up the highlight, right? That's about where I'd been at all the other, uh, and you know, and you've all automatically got like if, like it's a, it's built in filtration and this is just the characteristics of the lens. Uh, much more so than the, uh, than even the super speeds, right? Um, and definitely much more than um, the, uh, the Leicas. So again, not for everything. It just kind of depends on what kind of story you want to tell, right? Um, Are these lenses coated lenses? Yeah, they're, they're uh, old coating. Old coating. Old coating. <clears throat> yeah, there's been, uh, that's, a good, that's a good point because, uh, you know, like there's some lenses, it's like as an aesthetic, uh, which I, we don't have any here, uh, re like, the, you know, they've been the coatings have been stripped off of them and it and uh you know makes them much more uh susceptible to like kind of veiling glare uh flare uh and that's usually you're going to use those for a specific reason um you know a lot of times you'll kind of like for stylistic commercials and whatnot uh that's become something that you know a lot of people kind of dig uh but most mod, especially more modern lenses, they have, you know, like coatings, it's like a minimize, you know, a lot of those aberrations and especially flaring. Um, let's look at the hundred. I'm sorry, the, the 
ones that are rebuilt, they don't have the coating on them anymore, has not been replaced with something else? It, 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 yeah. It, it would have to be stripped off. They still are coated. They still oh. have coatings. But usually the lenses are uh, specifically manufactured or they, well, you can have the coating stripped off of them, you know, but, uh, but uh, you're really getting into something that is then a definitely a specific look that uh, is not for day in, day out filmmaking, at least most of the time. Okay, so then they're rehousing these older lenses. They're just taking the glass. Uh, they're not, they, they are stripping the coating that's on there? No. Oh, okay. No. Okay. It's, it's only if that's specifically requested. Oh, okay. okay. And like, so with a lot of these lenses, I think that that, w you know, you just never, they are already inherently uh, have their own uh, Quality. character qualities that, you by stripping the coating off that's an extra step of like i'm not i haven't ever seen that personally okay. but you're probably going to get something that is is, is going to be for a very specific use uh and at that We'll back up a little bit. When they were 15 years ago, you could probably get a whole set of those things for five or ten thousand dollars, and now it's on on house. So it's kind of for paper pictures. That's right. That's right. Wow. So, and then it costs another twenty five to get a new house. So it's that. So it's really, really, and, and that's happening with all the cars, and three thirty five. So we'll want the matte box back on. The coating is really an asset then. Well, it depends. Like on Zeiss Super Speed, the lenses that we had up earlier, we have, we have those front elements stripped of their anti-refractive coating so they'll give more flair and more characteristics and stuff like that and for a specific look. I mean, you know, is it is it a fad? It's sort of a fad. It's, it's a signature look that you're putting on your, on your commercial or on your film. Um, you know, but it'll, it'll probably go back to be really Thank you. Okay, yeah, I remember uh, I had the opportunity to buy a set before the digital, uh, you know, revolution truly kind of took hold. I, you know, could have bought a set of Baltar, Super Baltars for 10 grand, and man, I wish I had. Uh, but I was like, I'm, when am I going to use these, you know? <laughs> because they were very difficult to use on film, like really not easy. Um, okay, so... Uh, here we go. Let's get this. So this is the hundred. Uh, a lot of the times, at least that I've found with these, again, like the 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 longer lenses, they tend to hold up a little better. Uh, a little less vignetting than certainly the wide ones. Um, but again, they still have kind of like a, you know, like an already kind of filtered quality. Um, uh, we're tack sharp here, trip, as much as. We think, um, again, like not a whole lot of reason to needing to kind of get into the using diffusion with these. And that's one of the additional things that I really like about um, these vintage lenses on modern cameras. Yeah. Um, but, you know, otherwise, it's like, again, this is just, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flavor. I've always, there's something about the way they render color. Uh, that I've always just really kind of liked. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's kind of like putting on like a, if it was a lens for different kind of like painters or, or, or whatever, it's, it's, it's a lens that I like having on the camera. Um, and again, only for specific projects, not for everything, but uh, they're, they can be very expressive, you know, kind of immediately and a bit more so than, than uh, what you may have to do 
manipulation wise with like the more modern lenses because you know sometimes you have to like work with like you know filtration and kind of building a look uh, with a DIT in terms of LUTs to kind of you know like when you're, you're looking for like a specific look that's just not just completely out of the box press record um, you've already, you're automatically you're automatically there and that said it's like I've, when I have used these before uh, at least on one project, I still did a fair amount of LUT uh, work with the DIT and a colorist before we uh, entered into it to even push it farther and to make it even furtherly antique. Um, but that was, you know, uh, it's just kind of part of the workflow now. Uh, okay, so th this, let's see, what do we have? We only have the anamorphic left as far as funky stuff, right? Yeah, it's, oh yeah, it's totally warm. And like some of them, uh, like they can be really warm. And like one of the, one of the things again to look out for is like uh, uh, how much color shift do you have and how much matching you're going to have to do later, either on set with the DIT or later in color correction. Usually you'll always find these to be completely correctable. Uh, it's just a matter of the, you know, how much time you want to spend doing that. Um, you know, to kind of get them into a range to where it's like each lens is telling the same story. Um, but yeah, I just kind of love these and it's like, an, again, what I think what, when they really shine is like with a lot of depth uh, and, a lot of, and a lot of contrast, I feel like that they really come alive then. Um, but this has been a, uh, a lens I've loved for the last uh, few years. This is wide open. Yeah, so this is 2.3. Most all of these are two, three. So I would then, can we go, let's see, I want to stop down a little bit. So here's a two, eight. And like I said, there was a set that I was using on an Alexa that several of the lenses, there was no way I could shoot wider than a four. Whenever I would go a wider than a four, uh, a, a fair amount of color, color shift would happen. They would, they would get even warmer uh, or uh, some of them you just could not keep anything in focus like it would be like wide open they would be totally soft but then you stop down to like about a four and it's like and they came into something that was like uh, they I thought they looked great you know but that's a, it's one of the things you just don't see with lenses most of the time um, uh, because certainly you know the modern stuff it's like one three two two eight you're always going to be in a place to where it's like hey these look great you know, and you can actually shoot with them. Uh, so again, testing is hugely important with these. So this is a 2.8, right? And are we at a, we're, we're a thousand? Yes, we are. Do you want me to drop the book? We're at 1.2 no. MB. Oh, you're at one point, no, you're at a, really, 1.2? 1.2. Yeah, drop that out and then we'll just stop down from there. That's 0.6. That's 0.6. Okay, so go to 800 ASA, please. Okay, so, and you can kind of see, it's like there's definitely, they, these are pretty warm, uh, you know, and they kind of like start to really affect the blacks, you know. Here, let's dial down. Well, well let's see. This is, this is down, but like if we'll take this back up to our higher level, which this has been consistent every time for each lens, and you would really have to watch it with flares here. Now, Obviously, a good bit of this is because it's on a it's on a uh, it's a hundred mil, you know. And the longer the lens, the more exaggerated the effect goes. But you can even see, like, when you're panning the camera, like you could be here and you could have something that's it's obviously starting to milk out the blacks for sure. But as you pan, you're getting a wildly kind of different effect. So it's like you could if. If you're, say, doing a commercial or a music video or you're doing a pretty kind of poetic movie and, and you're wanting something that is uh, expressive, you know, th these automatically, uh, uh, it's one of those brushes that you, in your paint box that uh, you can immediately use and it brings something special to the table immediately. Uh, but one of the things is you have to kind of know when it's too much, you know. I mean, I kind of like this. I think that looks cool. Uh, but a lot more aberrations. 
but you know it's one of those things you just have to kind of know what you're getting into. Um, we'll look at an anamorphic lens in just a moment, and it's a it's a more modern anamorphic lens, but you'll kind of see this. Uh, uh, even though this is a spherical lens, it's like you'll see some of the similar characteristics to some of the older anamorphics. And uh, if I if we have time, I have another clip that I can show that's. Uh, that was done with vintage anamorphics um, where you kind of get in a similar territory. This comes with baggage, you know, uh, and you have to understand that baggage into where you're not, because you, you could easily screw yourself sometimes. Like you could begin to shoot something to where it's just like, man, that is definitely not sharp enough. It's one thing to look at it on a monitor. It's another thing when you get into the, you know, say the do the DI and you're in the screening room and it's, you know, now 20 feet wide. Uh, oh man, that's a little, that's not, that's a little softer than I thought it would be. Uh, and you know, it's even going to get bigger, like more uh, exaggerated when you're on a 50 foot screen. So uh, as much as you can follow through, uh, knowing what your end platform is going to be, like, uh, it's easier to kind of sometimes get away with uh, some of these flaws when you're on a TV screen. And you know that like you're doing a TV show, a commercial, um, you can shoot with some cameras, you can shoot with some lenses that you can, e it's easier to get away with than when you're, you know, big, big, wide, uh, you know, movie screen. So it's like, that's one of those things, following it through to, in the test process, as far as you can to know what you're getting into. Um, yeah, so why don't we look at this anamorphic and then we can kind of talk and then we'll do start to kind of mess around with a little bit of lighting stuff. Um, let's see, so with uh, anamorphics, uh, and everybody knows what those are, right? I'm sure everyone knows what those are here. Um, I particularly love this format and uh, whenever you kind of start to prep a film or, you know, it can, it can whether it's, it's, they, they can be used in television, but it's far less common because uh, usually it's like what you're delivering is more of a one seven eight kind of uh, aspect ratio. That said, it's like there are times when you can use them at just, uh, you know, not for the widescreen element, uh, but for uh, the depth of field and kind of with anamorphic, what you're paying for is the depth of field. Uh, there's something that's, very quite special about the you know like it's basically uh, it's kind of like what's back here what's not in focus uh, the way the anamorphic lens renders backgrounds uh, is just, you know there's nothing like it um, so it's the widescreen uh, you know before they started doing super 35 uh, you know when anamorphic kind of was originated it's uh, you know, it was a way to kind of get uh, people back into the movie theaters in the, well, I guess it was the, really the 50s, uh, you know, because people started watching TV, right? And so uh, this was like one of those cinema inventions of like, hey, let's make movies big again, right? Uh, and special. And they would make these, you know, from Lawrence of Arabia to like, I mean, uh, you know, many, like Dr. Zhivago. Uh, you know, Cinerama, like all these things. But it was like, we're widening the picture, right? Um, but you're actually squeezing the, you know, and the, it was kind of, well, I'll just use the film gate analogy. So it was kind of like a, you know, 35 millimeter film gate. You know, it's all, it's like basically a square-ish, right? And uh, in order to get the wider picture, you're kind of squeezing the image onto the, you know, the, to the, uh, to the 35 millimeter aperture, and then, of course, it gets unsqueezed in projection. But so one of the characteristics became, since it wasn't like a spherical lens, um, and this is a 40. We only have one lens. It's a, it's a wide one, um, which we'll drive in a little bit. We'll go Wes Anderson on this. I think Wes Anderson only uses a 40, pretty much, from what I understand. Love this stuff either, but like I appreciate it. Um, okay, so we'll do this wide lens close thing only because we have to. Uh, you know, anamorphics. It's like a lot of the time uh, there. Uh, you kind of think landscape picture. Uh, 
going down. Trip go ahead. Give a chance. Yeah, go ahead. You kind of th you kind of think landscape picture. Uh, they're good for wide vistas, you know, because it's a it's a wide image. Um, there's a certain epic quality to it, or they can be. Um, I think that they can work just as well on intimate pictures also because of the way they can hold a face. And again, it's what, what the background becomes. Um, these lenses with, uh, the, with highlights in the background, with depth, like I say, there's just kind of nothing like the, uh, you know, that, uh, that depth of field. Uh, so you can kind of see it's like, you know, on what stuff are we at here? 2A. This is 2A. Okay, cool. All right, so automatic, you know, like there's, you know, there's a, automatically a lot bit less depth of field. And like the bokeh of the, you know, kind of like the, the twinkle lights here, it becomes irregular. A lot of times, and depending on what lenses you're using, they can have different characteristics um, in terms of, uh, here, let's do some racking here. Uh, let's, I'm going to let you do that. Just kind of from background to foreground. Uh, like this is a more modern lens, so it's going to handle it a lot better, but then you kind of come to the foreground. A lot of these lenses will have, they'll breathe a lot more, which means you'll really kind of feel, it's almost like it's a, you know, as the focus shifts, it almost feels like there's a, you know, the perspective shift. And some of them are much greater than others. Uh, with the more modern anamorphics, there's a lot, again, there's a lot less of that. They're like a lot cleaner from edge to edge. When you get into the more vintage stuff, the older stuff, whether that be uh, some of, um, you know, it's mainly Panavision lenses, which uh, whether that's kind of B series, which only recently became even able to use them anymore. Uh, but C series, uh, E series, uh, and then they kind of get more modern from there. Primos, G series, now T series. I think they have. Uh, they're a lot cleaner. But like the the older ones, some of them can breathe like a lot. And I mean, it, to the degree of like where, um, whenever you're entering into a show where it, we want it anamorphic, but what kind of anamorphic do you want? Do you want do you want something where it's like uh, again we're going to do a more modern storytelling? Um, or we want like a kind of a little bit more of like a clean, consistent kind of look, but still have that depth of field. Wide screen, but also that, that, that milk, that, um, that kind of luscious depth of field that it gives you. Um, then, you, you know, that there's, there's reasons to go with like the, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the Cooks or the anamorphic uh, G series, T series or Primos, even though they're enormous. Hawk is another uh, manufacturer. Uh, I mainly have used the Panavision lenses, all different kinds. Uh, and then when I've done the vintage stuff, like the, more, the old ones, they've been uh, Joe Dutton's, uh, like some of Joe Dutton's lenses, which uh, now the only ones you can really get from my understanding are the Crystal Express lenses, uh, <clears throat> which uh, he'd sold the Panavision along, uh, God, I don't, I don't know when. But he basically liquidated all of his lenses and he tried to buy them back and couldn't. It was sad. Anyway, but there, there's a lot of the Crystal Espresso lenses floating around. And um, later on, if, I have a, if we have time, I think we will, I'll show a clip from a film I did that was vintage. It was Crystal Express Anamorphics. Uh, but I couldn't use the wide lens, like the 30. I could only use 40, 40 through like 135. And the 135 we had was, uh, I have to remember which, that wasn't a Crystal Express lens. But anyway, um, I had to, I, the, the wide lens, was, there was so much distortion in it, and you get this with the, the older lenses, uh, that it, I just deemed it unusable. Like it was, it was of a character that was not the rest of the lenses, which you could kind of get away with kind of having that kind of softer, kind of like special, like, uh, um, poetic look, but like the wide lens was just, I mean, you, you couldn't, we were shooting in a, a, a house a lot of the time and you, there's no way you could shoot the doorway because it would just bend, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you couldn't even at a, 
even for wide, wide, wide shots, very vignetted. Um, so on that film, and only this was only possible because it was a digital movie, an Alexa movie, and not film. I actually, for the wide end, used a 14 millimeter Zeiss Super Speed uh, for the wide shots. So anything wider than 40 that I needed wider than 40, I would use the, I would go to the spherical lens that still had a little bit of a vintage quality, but uh, was sharp enough and, and it held the edges enough to where there was minimal distortion. Um, but it still fit in fairly well because it was such a wide lens that the, some of the characteristics and the difference in depth of field, you didn't notice so much. And it was also the subject matter of that movie was really weird. Uh, so it, it kind of fed into um, all the lens aberrations, meaning like the imperfections of a lot of, um, with those particular lenses, you don't see it as much here, a lot of vignetting. And uh, it, it just, they, they had a lot of character. And then the way I would use the 14 spherical lens would be in only certain situations uh, and Real, and really close. And so it had a little bit of its own distortion effect to it. Um, <clears throat> it's too bad we don't have a longer anamorphic because, uh, you know, like once you get to the, the hundred, especially, uh, you, you, you know, it's a really nice close up lens and you usually want to do 135. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, shooting close ups on, a, on an anamorphic hundred, I mean, you're kind of like in the five foot away like range uh, so it's you usually need to be on the 135 150 for like more of a proper close-up that you're not kind of right in there but um, they f they just have a really beautiful like special texture to them um, whenever uh, <clears throat> whenever you're close on a face just as much as when you have a beautiful wide vista uh, they also, depending on the lens, the, they flare. They have a lot of, uh, these cooks are pretty clean. Uh, I don't even know if we, it may be harder to get these to flare. Hey, bring, bring up that backlight. Okay. Yeah, see, these are fairly clean. Like, uh, <clears throat> they of course have some kind of like, um, you know, like they definitely are kind of getting some flare, but it's not that kind of, uh, typical lens flare that you would kind of see from some of the older, you can bring that back down, older anamorphics. A lot of like the Panavision lenses, they would have signature kind of flares where it's like they would be, I think it's the C-series especially, where it's like you've probably seen this in whether it be Spielberg movies, some Jane Cameron movies, um, <clears throat> you know, you'll get that specific blue lens flare to where it's like, and it stretches all the way across the frame. Um, very specific to those lenses. Um, and there's something that's kind of like classically cinematic about it. And, and uh, they would have, like, you could use lens flares in like kind of an expressive way, you know? And I think even, uh, even though it wasn't 100% my cup of tea, uh, guys like J.J. Uh, Abrams and Dan Mandel, uh, like on these Star Trek movies, they would specifically use flare, lens flares, like with a, you know, a can like a, flashlight right off of the, you know, right off the edge of frame to intentionally get some of those flares and as an artistic uh, uh, detail, you know. Um, <clears throat> I think that that, and the, but that's something that's like you wouldn't get with a spherical lens in the same way. It's not going to stretch across the frame the entire, uh, in the same way. Uh, you can get a flare, but it's just, it's one of those things that it's a lot of the times it feels like a mistake. Uh, I kind of feel like that uh, with uh, anamorphic especially, it's like when you're going for that, it's kind of like it can be an instant win. You know, it's just like, yes, this looks great. Uh, but again, it's like it's one of those things that it's like it's a, an artistic tool. And since I'm kind of like a guy who, if I could set every movie in the 70s or like from that era or that style, I probably would. Uh, just because that's kind of like what I like. Um, so anyway, so that's the anamorphics. Uh, I wish we had another one. Um, if there's something someone would like to n see with this lens before we take it off and go back to something else. Otherwise, we maybe we'll go back to like a, a Leica and we can kind of work on a little bit of a lighting, you know, talk about lighting a little bit. How fast is that lens? This is a 2.3, I believe. 
And then, you know, so uh, this is a good, uh, this is wide open. Obviously, uh, we would need to, hey, dial the back, the fill, like down like 10%, please. So that's wide open there, Bobby. No, just dial everything down 10%. Just so we get back into a, a, an area of, so before we take that limbs off, like key and everything. And here, let's turn this like way down. Okay. Okay, so I mean, yeah, uh, this lens wide open. Seems like we're just out focus wise. Let's see. Can you also take off the matte block? Oh, sure. We'll see what happens with both of them. So let's just kind of check focus real quick there. Yeah, so this lens uh, wide open. We'll get it probably once we kind of really check focus. It's kind of on the edge, right? If and that's maybe being generous. There you go. That's better, right? Yeah, it's good. So <clears throat> a lot of these more modern ones, you can certainly get away with a bit, bit more. Uh, with the more classic ones, uh, again, I'll just kind of mainly go back to the Panavision lenses, which is predominantly what I've used. Uh, Harder to shoot wide open, uh, but I will say uh, again, one of the, if you if you really pick your set well, uh, you with the digital sensors, I've found that I can shoot wide open anamorphic, and that's something that I've shot several anamorphic movies on film with different lenses, and v becomes much harder to do. Uh, it just the depth of field gets so small that when you are having to try to choose, and you still have to, to a degree with the digital sensor, when you have to choose which eye you want in focus, you know, and it's not like it's a big, it's truly can be like just a you know, half an inch of difference. And I, they're just harder to shoot it uh, out uh, wide open. But uh, I was able to do, I did a film in a, a couple of years ago where I was using E-series uh, which were mainly from the 80s. I think it was more Nikon glass. Uh, they were Panavision, but uh, uh, and but that film was set in uh, where uh, it was kind of post-apocalyptic to a certain degree, and there's no electricity, so everything was either natural, like kind of natural light, natural you know interior daylight, or candlelight, moonlight, you know, with mix a candlelight mix, and I was able to shoot wide open anamorphic at 800 ASA uh, by candlelight. And um, so that was liberating, you know, with just a little bit of augmentation. Like the candles doing most of the work and then I had these uh, covered wagons, like almost like mailboxes with like kind of incandescent, like kind of uh, uh, light, you know, household light bulbs in them just covered in muslin. Just put those in a couple of places and away we went. Right, uh, but it would have been virtually impossible to do on film. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with the light sensitivity of the cameras. You know, it's like, and you can really kind of push the push the envelope with, you know, on the, the 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 toe end of the you know the the light spectrum. The you can really push the sensor into a place to where it's like you can get pretty naturalistic, super low light results. Uh, so I mean, that's that's great. Okay, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about lighting stuff. That's all I was going to talk about about lenses. If there's any kind of specific questions about any of that, the stuff we've kind of covered before while we're changing lenses, happy to entertain that. Otherwise, um, go to, uh, let's go to like that 40. Okay, so... Um, Next thing we can kind of talk a little bit about is lighting. And uh, I don't necessarily, sometimes with lenses, and I'll keep it in the lens test world for just a moment. Once I'm kind of done with kind of like what filters would be, uh, 
then sometimes it's like I want to check, like, I, uh, then I'll kind of break out of what I would call just a kind of like normal general lighting setup, which is what this has been, uh, and then try to push it a little more, right? Um, in terms of uh, like uh, different lighting ratios and um, just to kind of see how the, you know, the lenses uh, resolve in terms of like that, that kind of dynamic range. Uh, but that's about all I'm going to, uh, that's about all I'm going to do with lenses unless it's like specifically to like vintage lenses and to s see how wide open I can shoot them. Um, other than that, it's like, uh, I find that, especially when you find a camera, because I, I just usually kind of think of these cameras now as like it's a film stock. So when I find a camera that is a, a, a film stock I like, which is the Alexa for me, um, you have to do, like, I've I found that I do a bit less light testing, you know, testing of kind of like emulsion testing. Because what you used to have to do is you would, uh, can we back the frame up to like a little bit mid-medium kind of thing? Back the... Yeah, dolly up. I'm not going to grab the dolly, but you can. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I got it. I understand. Um, let's include the practical a little bit. Okay. Um, let's see, where was it? Oh, yeah. So when it, you, you used to have to do a bit more emulsion testing, and you would kind of like, I would really kind of go through with a, with, um, a gray card, grayscale, a Macbeth chart, a Macbeth chart sometimes, which is like the color chip chart, uh, of going through and testing like what, uh, you know, what's normally exposed, what's one, one stop over, two stops over, three stops over, you know, et cetera and so forth. And, but especially in the low end, uh, you know, um, like really kind of into four or five stops under. To really find out where you really start to lose it, like say I, I, I was doing something to where it's, I, I feel like the fill level in general wants to be three stops under, which is, was, for film was darkish, you know, not super dark, but, um, and you'd really want to know what that looks like, because at that time, and even if you're still doing it, because sometimes you still get to do it, uh, you really have to know what those ratios are. You have to, because you're not seeing it immediately on a, on a screen. It's not instant gratification. So uh, I would do a lot more light testing in terms of like uh, different fill, like diff different fill levels, you know, just to find what the look of the movie was, right? Now it's like, it's, it's a little less necessary because it's like, uh, you, you kind of know a little bit more once you've worked with the camera for a while. You kind of know what you're going to be doing lighting-wise. You, you, you know what your fill level is, where it's going to fair, like, basically land. And even if you were kind of a little bit off, it's like, oh, hey, let's bring the fill level down. Or let's bring the key up. Or et cetera and so forth. So it's like I've, I've found that there can be a little less testing, at least for me, light, lighting-wise, unless I'm trying to do something with color and gels and uh, or like say I'm trying out a new uh, a new light you know um, that said um, here's where it's like you kind of get into this is back to uh, the Leica lens oh and can we put the matte box back on please thanks and let's I guess we can start here so what I usually do uh, is something like this so you can can we just kill everything except the practical? Okay. Here, can I have you back up slightly? Just like say. Well, this is a little low, but yeah, somewhere like that. Okay, so sometimes what I would do is just kind of start, it's like, what's, what the, what's a lamp naturally give you? You know, this is a 40 watt bulb, right? We'll kind of go wide open. Um, we'll leave this uh, background, like these, 
The monitors, again, I think it's like a, you would definitely only want to do this with a calibrated like monitor that you can know, like it's basically what you're going to be shooting with, what you're going to be judging your lighting by. Um, so these are obviously a bit more contrasty and not, you know, I kind of would certainly consider these more for like focus than for lighting. Um, but so here we have, they were wide open, 800 ASA. Uh, it's just the lamp. This is what that naturally looks like. All right, so do I want to, then it kind of depends on, uh, there are different reasons why you would kind of, if you're doing a lens, just lens testing, like again, more important for film, to me a little less important. Uh, depends what kind of genre thing, uh, picture you're making, right? It's, this could look cool, but it's really contrasty, right? So then at that point, it's like, uh, if we're wanting to make something that feels natural, right, uh, that it's truly lamp lit, right, uh, then you, we want to kind of add some artif like artificial light into our scenario, right? So here it's like you'd start with some fill light. Uh, so let's bring that on at like f just halfway for now, 50%. Okay. All right, hold that. Well, hold that. Now, uh, I feel like that we're in a place, and, and again, this is like if we're in a room, it depends what kind of room we're in. Here we're just in a, obviously a stage, a box. Uh, uh, there is nothing kind of else in here except this lamp, you know, providing like that's where our motivation is coming from. So here's where I feel like, hey, Brendan, let's get that light mat. So here's where I feel you kind of like then, okay, what are we going to do? We need a little bit more fill light, but I don't want it overall so general from the big bounce in the back. So it's like, let's just kind of put that about like, say, right here, right? And so we're going to fill in a little bit of the shadow side, right? Uh, since we've got these practical, uh, like, uh, twinkle lights in the background, we'll say that that's kind of part of our, part of our room, part of our set. Maybe you want to add a little backlight to that. Well, thankfully I have one up there. Um, which one's this one? Three? Okay, I'll get you, yeah, I'm way over here, but like, okay, so I don't want to go tungsten. Okay, so uh, is that tungsten? Yes. Yeah. Okay, looks like it. Okay, so now way less. Should dim it down, down, down. Keep going. Whoa, whoa. Kind of hold that for now. Okay, uh, and then can you go after you get that set? Can you just go to the backlight and just bring it up just a slight, slightly? Uh, go to five. And that would need to be warmed up a little bit, it seems like. But you have to get up there to warm it up? Is that right? Okay, well, let's, we'll hang there for now. Okay, so if I'm, like, building something, and again, this monitor's not kind of, like, it's certainly not perfect. So if I'm building something that wants to feel real and natural, then it's like I'm going to kind of get to a place to where it's like, oh, I could maybe buy that as she's in, you know, sitting in a, you know, a dark living room or whatever, right? Uh, just with a little bit of added fill light. One problem is the practical reads too bright. doesn't seem realistic to me, you know? Like it's just kind of, I've been one, it's like I've never liked that kind of like, Although I've done it before, you shoot some stuff where you are just using practicals. And that's one of the things you kind of live with a lot of the time. It's just a brighter, if you're lighting, um, lighting the room with the practicals, a lot of times they do need to seem a little, they have to be a little unnaturally bright. At least it, there's not many other ways to get away with it. So, let's see. Hey, Brendan, do you mind getting on that? 
Okay, well, that's not bad. Okay, so you kind of maybe bring this down to a level that's like, oh, that's photographable, but now our actor's not anymore. It doesn't look right. So now we got to bring the key on, right? Okay. Maybe just uh, just a tick more, just a just a whisker. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you know, basically, you're gonna kind of like let's we'll get to a place we're gonna destroy what was natural and make it photographable. And even with the digital cameras, as good as they are, a lot of the time, that's what you're going to have to do also, right? Um, so it kind of depends, then it's like, okay, what genre are we in, you know? Uh, you know, this is, at least from what I'm looking at here, a little on the dim side in terms of like, we could certainly make the key brighter, right? So maybe we do that. If we're making a different movie, say we're making a comedy, uh, this is certainly something that, like, maybe in a European comedy, I'd like to work in France. I like working in France. It's really great. Um, if we were doing that, then, hey, you know what? You could probably get away with this. Down south in Hollywood, they're not going to like that. And it's just true. <laughs> they're not. So uh, why don't you kind of bring up the key to something, right? Keep going. A little more. Okay. All right. So. Uh, a little bright now it's like we would if we're making a comedy we're uh, we're gonna have to have more fill light right so we have to bring up the fill light is that on the left I can't remember the level no that's the color temp it's this one okay all right well, let's see. We'll we'll see how far down the road of kind of truly massaging this to truly make it like like roll camera. Like if we may or may not do that. <laughs> um, okay. So then you kind of get into ah, this to me. This looks kind of looks a little lit still, even though it's like a lot with a comedy style. You have to play a little bit to that kind of like higher key, like a you know. There's a certain and I can't remember if I covered any of this or not. There's a certain commercial expectation that you have to maybe try to adhere to if you don't want to get fired. I don't like getting fired. Uh, but I also like to do good work, right? So um, one of the problems becomes, ah, uh, oh, this is just, this, this a little, the light's a little too hard. So what would we do? Well, one thing is this diffusion frame, I moved closer to the light so that people could see a little better. But now we're not going to do that. So why don't we take the diffusion frame closer. Let's kind of bring it to about here, right? And this is one of those things, it's like, uh, you know, oftentimes it's like we've certainly been in the era, okay, so you can come down with it. Okay, good, all right. We've certainly been in the era of, okay, so do this for me. Take it closer to the light and then slowly bring it back to where we are. And some of this, if you want to do it in hand, it's kind of fine. So obviously, if you kind of see, it's like, uh, this is one of those things where, oh, it's the same piece of diffusion. It's in front of the light. It's covering the light. But the closer you bring it to the subject, keep going, keep going. Yeah, just don't, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, great. You kind of get it just out of frame, and it's like the farther away the diffusion is from the light, the softer the quality becomes. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the times, uh, so it's like that's one of the things to where it's in terms of like trying to get back to a place, and this fill light's still too much. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, trying to get back to a place to where it becomes a little more photographable and a little more kind of like aesthetically pleasing and can like look like, oh, she's lit from the lamp. Uh, even though if we turn the key off, certainly wouldn't be. Can you go, uh, Brennan, thanks for that. Can you go to the dial and then maybe take the key down like 2%? Um, can you split the difference just a, whisk, a little bit? Okay, okay, hold that. All right, so we'll be in somewhere in that range. Now, can you just turn the key off and go... Okay, so if we said that this was obviously our natural lamp level, I like this. This could be really cool, but depending on what movie you're on, it's not going to fly, right? Or either it doesn't feel realistic 
or it's too murky, too, too down. I like doing this kind of thing sometimes, but right now we're making a comedy. So we can turn the light back on, right? And you can kind of bring it back to where it was. Okay, so now we got to a place to where it's like in our, say, our comedy world, uh, it's maybe, you know, this is maybe the look we're going for. Uh, there are certainly those, and these monitors, if you're over here, it's really low contrast. If you're right in the middle of it, it sort of looks okay. So try to be right in the middle of it. Um, there may be uh, a place to where the fill level is, you still need more, right? Uh, you get a, you know, the guy in the studio is like, I can't see their faces, which they sometimes say that. And, you know, you may have to then really kind of milk it out into where it's like, oh, now it's totally, it gets less and less, uh, you know, you lose more, I lose more integrity. Whenever this goes up, I just lose more integrity, you know, that's what it is. It's the integrity meter. So <clears throat> there may be, you know, there are plenty of styles out there of like, say, different kinds of films. Say it's uh, I, you know paint by numbers whatever movie at this uh, cineplex, um, usually more in the comedy genre to where it's like it's just light the room, see the faces. I just want to laugh, right? Um, like whenever I try to approach, whenever I do those movies, and I do do those sometimes because I have to pay the bills. Um, these indie movies don't do it as so well. Uh, try to still imbue them with some amount of naturalism and try to push as far as you can in terms of making something that's more like a drama, a uh, little, little bit more like a drama, but up to the point to where people are not going to fire you, you know. Uh, and I've kind of, I've been, I've been in good sh for most of the time. Um, I think we have a sh little short here, Brendan. This is crapping out on me. Anyway. Um, you have to decide what level, uh, it was kind of going in and out, I don't know why. You have to decide what you can kind of get away with and what kind of movie you're making, right? So uh, now if we were making a drama, like this truly straight up drama, and I, we sort of did a little bit of that, but maybe we'll follow that through a little more. It's like, well, I'm probably just going to turn this off, right? And we go less on the fill light. Like this one, actually flash it off for me, just the, the bounce fill. Okay. So maybe that's not bad. Maybe now you just need a kiss of this. Right? Just a little. Okay, and now I'd probably say, hey, the key's a little too bright. Let's bring that down too. It's all about making it darker. Yeah, now we're talking. Now we're getting there, right? Oh, maybe you need a little bit of an edge light. Maybe there's a TV back here, right? Can you flash this one on for me or do I turn it on? I'll let you do it. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, great. All right, I'm just guessing. Um, that's too much. Softer, a little less. Oh, oh, hold that. Now, like, uh, drag it out of frame a little bit. Keep going. Go, go, go. Whoa. That's good. Right there. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, now, flash that off for me. And then on. Okay. Bring it up like a just a whisker. Okay. Oh, hold that. All right. Uh, that's a little too blue for my taste. So it's like we would maybe take some of the like daylight out of it. What temp was that? Forty four. Yeah, now we're at thirty seven. All right, now turn that off, please. And then on. Okay. Say so there's a TV over there in our living room, right? And it's like, and you maybe need to add, like whether sometimes you see it in the frame, and it could be a, it could be another uh, situation, just like the lamp. Well, that TV screen's way too bright, right? Now. Fortunately now it's much easier to like do it like as long as you don't have people like a head in it or something and even now you can take care of it. You could do a lot of that later. Hey, do I just want a light from the TV? Right? And then um, then bring the screen down later as long as it's not too overexposed because there is there are those limits. Um, 
then I would do that. Otherwise, I have to add a light to kind of mimic my TV that say is right here, and, and you know. Um, but you know, obviously, this is with just the basically same lighting setup. It's obviously something just sitting in a living room reading a book. Uh, it's just kind of light levels, obviously, uh, and level of fill light in a lot of ways that drives one genre to another. Um, so that's just a couple of things in terms of like a, just a couple of different genres. Obviously, there's a lot more and a lot different ones. Um, some of the things that like uh, then I then think are kind of interesting is when you try to break out of, and you can bring the fill light back on just for now, and we'll chat just for a second and then figure out which way to go with this lighting thing. Um, is when you're using like, uh, and although I really don't have that much with me right now, but uh, whenever you're, you try to get away from using movie lights, you know? Um, so sometimes, uh, I would have, and I, again, we don't have it here, but sometimes I would like have the electricians build me, uh, uh, usually it can be a square or it can be like a, like a, or it can be round, but uh, I would get them to put like a lot of bulbs, like uh, say uh, they're all Edison bulbs, um, usually low wattage, no bigger than 25 watt, uh, sometimes maybe 15 is kind of better. Uh, in like a, like a tight array to where it's like maybe say 50, 60 bulbs uh, and kind of make some, like something of sort of your own light that's in kind of like a lo-fi way. And um, I'd use something like that sometimes just to get out of just using a movie light with say a Chimera and diffusion in front of it. You know, uh, it's something that like it, it just has a subtly different look. Uh, usually it's like you dim it down, like it's in a scenario where it's like, hey, I can shoot something really warm. This is like 1800 Kelvin, which uh, it doesn't matter, you know, I, that's what I'm going for. And then kind of do something to break out of just using movie lights, key fill, backlight, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, there's all sorts of different rules. There's all sorts of different styles people can adopt. Some people don't like, you know, don't use any backlight. Sometimes I, you know, it's kind of necessary. Uh, again, like reason why I sort of opened with kind of a motivation where I kind of came from, from like what I like, is that initially I felt like everything had to be motivated. And if it wasn't motivated by say that lamp, then I wouldn't be doing it. I would be, what in, what in the room is giving, you know, giving us the light? And then it's like I would just go from there. I didn't necessarily make anything up because it's like I just didn't want to do the job that way. I seldom did that anyway. Um, that said, it's like there's a, and I guess I'll touch on this for a second. There's like a, I guess you'd say, and help me out guys, please, but I think this is true. Like there's a more or less an industry kind of like a, a standard in cinematography lighting. It's like a, normally where you'd put a key light, for instance. And usually that's gonna be in the direction, that's gonna be where the actor is looking. So if in this scenario, it's like if there's someone off camera or if it's an over the shoulder and, you know, I'm here, it's like usually the key light's going to go over there most of the time. Like, in, I think if you look at most everything, uh, mo m certainly most television, I don't, I don't know a percentage, but that's mainly the way it's done, right? Uh, and there's certain reasons for that, uh, you know, like there's, you know, in terms of like being able to build contrast. Uh, you know, to have like a light side, a dark side, to where it's not just kind of like completely flat, which really is something that we usually try to, we usually try to give as much shape to the image as we can uh, based on the, you know, the situation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just kind of like looks more pleasing. It kind of looks better, right? But what you don't want to do and what I, what I try not to do is fall into a trap of like always doing something the same way. Oh, where is, where, you know, because you can very easily, when you're doing a blocking, say, uh, fall into where, like, a, a gaffer and I have a friend, uh, have a joke, just, and we don't really mean it, but it's kind of like, all we need to know is where they're standing and where they're looking, right? Because <clears throat> you don't want to fall into that trap of, like, that's always the way it is, you know? Uh, there are a lot of movies where that is completely the way it's done, and like I say, that's why I think it's become sort of industry standard to a certain degree. Um, so 
whenever I can, it's like I try to kind of break out of that. And, and that's why it, where, where, when I started, I, if the, say, uh, say the lamp is, is over there, but the other person is over here, and it becomes a, like a, you know, a, a, a flatter situation, the camera side, because it's usually called camera side lighting. And it, depending on the way the actor's looking, it can just be a lot flatter and not as interesting. And that's one of the reasons why you kind of, this is kind of developed, I think. Um, but I would do camera side lighting all the time. But it, I felt like, because that's the way it was motivated. But I felt like the way I was doing it, at least then, like it, it was on movies that could, you could get away with it because I would just make it a lot darker. You know, uh, if you're doing something that's like, say, a, uh, a more commercial oriented project, again, I'll just kind of go back to the comedy thing. It becomes a bit harder to do and have, and being able to maintain a look that truly looks good, right? So to me, it's like whenever you kind of break out of those uh, kind of norms of like the way you'd, oh, let's put the fill here, let's put the key there, uh, you know, backlight or not, kicker, you know, edge light, maybe. Um, whenever you can work on, and this is why I like working on indie movies whenever I can, indie weird dramas, is that you can not do that. You can totally break out of it. Like you can, like this can maybe not even be lit with a lamp at all. And like we can turn all this off and it's, and it's just through a window over here uh, and it's just a street light. And um, like whether it's camera side or not, doesn't matter. Where's the window? Again, it kind of then I can get back to my original thing about just motivation. Where's the light coming from? Um, so that's one of those things as far as like, even though there, there's a pattern to lighting and like kind of, and a, and a pattern to like make people look good, um, it's nice to not always have to follow that, I think. Um, let's see, uh, what, can, what else can we talk about here? Um, just a time, it looks like we're at 1.45, so we're about 16 minutes. <laughs>